parts of the chariot uh, are like the different factors uh, of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, uh, this sutta is found in the uh, uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, and this is called the Magga Sangyutta. Magga Sangyutta, the uh, Discourses on the Path, yeah, so that is the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and this is the fourth sutta of the Magga Sangyutta, and it is uh, uh, called, the name of the sutta is regarding the Brahmin Janu Soni. Janu Soni, one of the famous Brahmins at the time of the Buddha. These were kind of the, uh, uh, you know, the administrators and they were looking after the king and working with the king and they were the priests and all this kind of thing. Uh, so they were uh, very important, especially this particular Brahmin. And he is often found having conversations of the Buddha. So the Buddha is going to explain the idea of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah. So then he says that this Noble Eightfold Path, you can understand it in the following way. Yeah, it is the uh, vehicle of Brahma. It is the vehicle of truth. It is the supreme victory in battle. So these are the names for the name uh, for the Eightfold Path. Yeah, the vehicle of Brahma. So um, uh, Brahma in uh, the kind of the Buddhist idea and also the Hindu ideas before that, uh, it symbolizes kind of the highest. Uh, potential yeah in existence if you get reborn as a brahma or you kind of act like a brahma it means that you are incredibly pure and you are full of you know the the things that characterize a brahma is that they are full of the uh, the four brahma viharas that's why they're called brahma viharas yeah the four divine abidings they're called brahma viharas because that's where brahma abides so the uh, noble eightfold path is the vehicle of brahma yeah, so uh, obviously a very important uh, part of this vehicle is going to be the four divine abidings. Yeah, the metta, compassion, the, the love, if you like. Adan Sujato translates metta as love, which I think is actually quite nice and quite straightforward. And uh, uh, these are the factors. Yeah? So there's a vehicle, this is the highest vehicle, the best vehicle. There's nothing quite like the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and it's the vehicle of truth, the vehicle of truth in the sense that uh, this vehicle is based on truth. Yeah, it is based on truthful teachings. Start off with right view or truthful view, and it ends by truth. It kind of deepens that truth all the way along. You're seeing more and more in accordance with the reality as you go deeper and deeper on the path uh, until eventually one day, bang, and you see the big truth, yeah, the mega truth. Uh, and that is when you, you kind of be change your mind again you're kind of fixed in that that reality here yeah. and the truth is very beautiful yeah the idea of following the truth uh, because if we see things truthfully if we see things according with reality it means that we can make good choices uh, and this is kind of one of the very important things in life in general to see things uh, correctly not to be deluded we can make good choices if you don't see things according to reality how can you make a good choice how can you um, you know uh, even in ordinary life if you are deluded about how things work if you don't understand how if you're going to repair something that doesn't work but you don't understand how it is to be repaired you don't understand how it works you can't repair it. You need to understand it first of all. Uh, otherwise, you're going to make a mess of the repair job. Uh, so everything we do in life depends on not being deluded, on seeing things rightly. Then we can make good choices. Uh, so truth matters. Yeah, We should always look for truth in whatever we do. Uh, and this is why, as I was saying before, we should never really uh, throw out uh, other truths in our life, like the truths of science or the truths of whatever it is. Uh, all of these things need to be incorporated together. Why? Because we are seekers of truth, not of delusion, not of make-believe, not of a false kind of faith, but a faith based in reality. So this idea, the vehicle of truth, is very, very telling about the Buddhist teachings. And then it's called the supreme victory in battle. Yeah, this is the Noble Eightfold Path. Sometimes the practice of Buddhism is like compared to a battle where we go out fighting like a noble warrior yeah and we but what we fight with our weapons we shall see in a second what our weapons are our weapons are like loving kindness and compassion yeah <laughs> 
So there are different kinds of weapons that people normally do. And what we slay, what is it that we slay in the noble battle, in the noble fight? What we slay in the noble fight is anger. Anger is the one thing that we slay. So it's like a good fight, yeah? But sometimes it feels like we have to kind of, uh, you know, use, um, we have to kind of use the stealth of the Buddhist teachings to be able to uh, get around these uh, tricky defilements of our mind. And the, one of the main weapons that we use as well is the weapon of wisdom. We try to be wise. Uh, we don't use the force of a warrior or the power of a warrior. We try instead to be a smart warrior, the warrior who kind of tricks the enemy yeah, by doing something different, who is smart, yeah? the, the art of war, the you know, fighting the war in a kind of uh, intelligent way. Uh, and this, is, again, shows you just a matter of, uh, of uh, the um, significance of wisdom on this path. Uh, so uh, this is just one way the Buddha uses metaphors, the idea of battle. It's actually not a very common metaphor. It's important not to overstate that, uh, because if you overstate the idea of battle, we tend to use too much force, too much power. You might even use ill will, yeah, if you think too much of a battle. So don't think, uh, don't... Um, use that idea in the wrong way. But uh, sometimes, it, you know, some people kind of uh, get off on this idea of the valiant warrior who fights his way through the jungle of the defilements and comes out victorious on the other end. Uh, this is one of those uh, ideas you find in the sutta sometimes. Uh, so this is the Noble Eightfold Path. And then the Buddha uh, adds on, and this is where the, uh, the simile for the Noble Eightfold Path comes in. It is spoken in verse. And the Buddha says, its qualities of faith and wisdom are always yoked together. Conscience is its pole, mind is the a strap, and mindfulness the careful driver. The chariot is equipped with ethics. Its axle is jhana, the energy its wheels. Equanimity and immersion are the carriage shaft, and it's upholstered with desirelessness. Goodwill, harmlessness, and seclusion are its weapons, patience, its shield, and armor, as it rolls on to the sanctuary. The supreme Brahma vehicle arises in oneself. The wise leave the world in it, sure of winning the victory. So um, uh, it's a, let me just go through this in a, a bit more uh, detail. Uh, and you can see here how it starts off at the beginning with the qualities of faith and wisdom. Uh, yeah. So these are, uh, in the Pali, these are Sadha and Panya, faith and wisdom. Uh, and they are yoked, yeah, always yoked. It says here to the shaft, but I think more like they're always yoked together. Yeah, they are, um, I think, anyway, it doesn't really matter so much. Uh, but the idea is that faith and wisdom, uh, they are the draft animals uh, that pull the chariot. Yeah, there's a chariot is are driven by the draft animals, uh, are panya and sada. These are the things that pull the chariot. Uh, and that's quite interesting, yeah, because sometimes you might think that uh, it is the energy, yeah, the animals maybe uh, uh, they symbolize the energy of the chariot, yeah, not the wisdom and the faith, but actually it is wisdom and faith that pulls this chariot. Uh, and that is quite uh, unusual, perhaps, unless you start thinking about it. And of course, the reason why that is the case uh, is because. Uh, the chariot, the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path is right view. Yeah, right view is really wisdom, is the wisdom right view. Right view is also faith. You have faith in the right thing. You have understand, you know, you, you um, kind of coming from the right place. You have placed confidence in these teachings. And because right view is at the beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path, this is what makes the whole path work. Without those animals to pull that chariot of the Noble Eightfold Path, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, it is impossible. So this is just so significant. They are at the forefront. And what that means is that if you have right view to some extent, then the whole path will follow along. Yeah, 
you have no choice. These are the draft animals. If they are yoked to the chariot of the Noble Eightfold Path, that chariot will go forward. That's just the way it is. In the same way, if you have right view, then it is natural that the other aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path arise as a consequence of that right view. They all arise as a consequence of each other. And what this means is that the more powerful those draft animals are, the more powerful, the more faster, the more efficient that chariot is going to be, the more powerful it's going to be in battle, the faster it will get you to, from point A to point B. So by strengthening the chariot animals, the more powerful the Noble Eightfold Path will be, the stronger, more powerful your wisdom and your confidence are, the more ability you will have to practice the Noble Eightfold Path, or it will just unfold as a matter of course. You have no choice. You have to move towards Nibbana. You have to move towards happiness, whether you want to or not. Yes, you have to become happy. It's a good deal, isn't it? If you have to become happy, might as well, might as well do it, because that's probably what we are looking for anyway. So jump on board, get into this blooming chariot. Yeah, grab hold of the reins and let the right view, the wisdom and the uh, confidence at the front, let them do their work and drive you in the right direction, drive you into the beautiful territory beautiful territory of happiness where the land is nice and delightful, eventually mounting your little balloon, getting high above the ground into the Samadhi state, understanding what it is, getting insight into the nature of reality. That is where that chariot will eventually take you. So the more we strengthen these two factors, the more powerful the chariot is going to be. So this is one of the reasons why I think it is very often useful to look at the suttas from the standpoint of right view, remembering that all of these suttas are ultimately about right view. They are about us learning, seeing things in the right way, yeah? seeing things from the standpoint of the Buddha, allow, aligning our view of the world with the way the Buddha uh, sees the world, uh, having the right outlook on life, understanding what life is about, uh, and then getting the right values as a consequence of that. When we have the values right, we prioritize things in a new way. And when we prioritize things in a new way, our life changes, uh, yeah? The right intention, everything moves in a different direction as a consequence. Uh, so right view matters so much. Uh, and to get that right view, to strengthen it, we just need to keep on reflecting on these teachings. Uh, and um, I don't know about you, but maybe sometimes you think that every time I read out the suttas, I read the same suttas. And there is some truth to that, you know. I, <laughs> I do often read the same suttas and I may be bringing up the same similes and all of that. But uh, it is because I love these suttas. And for me, every time I read them out, uh, Every time I remind myself of this thing, this is what I find so marvelous to be able to teach you guys, yeah, is because I get inspired by these teachings. And if I have a chance to read it out to someone else, I actually love to listen to these teachings myself. And this is the great benefit of being a teacher. So thank you for listening here. Thank you for being there. Otherwise, I wouldn't have this opportunity here. So yeah, every time you read it, it goes a little bit deeper here. It gives that view, it becomes a little bit more right. It changes direction a little bit more. Something inside of you shifts gradually, gradually, gradually. And over the years, over the decades, you slowly become a better, more realistic, more dhammic kind of person. The dhamma sinks into you deep inside. So I hope you will forgive me for saying the same thing all the time and I hope you enjoy it just like I do and if you don't well then maybe you need to maybe you need a different teacher I don't know because this is the way I tend to do things so, so anyway so but also the fact here yeah which I talked about before so one thing is that we need to keep on developing right view but again the idea that the two animals that are the draft animals of this chariot are sadha confidence and panya wisdom yet yeah, they go hand in hand they are yoked together they are not independent of each other they must always go together you cannot really have one without the other yeah this is also pointed out by this particular simile and again this is one of those things that is very unique to the buddhist teachings there are so many things that are unique in buddhism i mentioned before that you are allowed to doubt things yeah this is very special in Buddhism, that it is based ultimately on your own understanding. 
this is special for Buddhism, that faith or confidence goes hand in hand with wisdom. This is also very special to Buddhism. You don't find many teachings of any kind that are like this. There's something very wholesome or right about these teachings that really is, you know, really lifts you up and inspires you in an entirely different way from most other teachings in the world, whether they are worldly teachings or whatever they might be. So, uh, they are yoked together, and then it says, conscience is the pole, yeah, so the pole of a chariot, the pole is what connects the animals to the chariot, there's a long kind of uh, uh, shaft, yeah, or, or long, um, uh, uh, like a, um, uh, yeah, like a pole, yeah? a long kind of piece of wood, basically, usually, that holds, that ties, goes from the yoke of the animals, and then goes back to the chariot, so it holds on to the chariot, this is what kind of makes the whole thing go together, so the chariot is driven by these animals, and the pole is conscience. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, that the pole should be conscience. Conscience is the Pali word is hiri, and when we think about hiri, we also think about otapa, otapa, yeah, these are the two things that always go hand in hand. Sometimes they are translated as shame and the fear of consequences. Uh, but I think conscience is quite nice. Uh, and another translation for otapa is prudence. So maybe conscience and prudence. Yeah, these are not bad words. Conscience is like when you feel that you have done something wrong and you feel bad about yourself because you've done something wrong. Yeah. Shame is often more external. We feel that other people are looking at us and think that we are bad. Yes, yeah? so it's like a, an externally imposed thing. Whereas a conscience is more coming from our ourselves, where we feel that this is not good enough and we should do better. Both of those things are useful. And then there is otapa, fear of the consequences. So when you have wisdom, yeah, when you have that wisdom at the very beginning, it naturally leads to a fear of the consequences because you understand that every time you do something in the wrong way, you think the wrong way, you're taking a step backwards. You're moving away from happiness. You're moving towards more suffering in the future. Yeah, so you get this very keen kind of alertness in your mind. The mindfulness becomes strong. Whoa, I've got to be careful. Yeah, this is the conscience and the fear of consequences kicking in. You don't want to do what is bad. Your mindfulness gets very much um, directed towards that area of life where you don't want to do anything bad. Yeah, this is kind of what happens here. And this is what it says in one of the well-known suttas that talk about Vidya and Avidya, and Vidya being the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, true knowledge, if you like, yeah, and Avidya, of course, being ignorance or delusion, and it says that when you have Vidya, when you have the true knowledge, uh, which here is very similar to right view, which is similar to wisdom, which is similar to sadha, <laughs> you can see how all of these things are very closely related to each other, yeah, and so the Buddha is showing these things from different angles, uh, but the Buddha says when you have that true knowledge at the beginning, the vidya, in other words, you have right view, then with that true insight, yeah, the real insight into experience, comes the hiri, comes the conscience, comes the shame, comes the fear of the consequences. So if you do feel a little bit conscious stricken, or you feel a bit afraid of the consequences for doing bad, it is not a bad thing, yeah? The Buddha says it comes from, if it is done in the right way, it comes from an understanding of the world, understanding life in the right way. So don't be too worried about that. Of course, it should not become like a big psychological burden. It should not become obsessive, that you become completely obsessed with guilt or whatever, or shame. But, it, but the fact that, there, that you don't feel quite right when you do something bad, that is a good sign. Yeah, it is not something that is to be pushed away, because this leads you in the right direction. But it has to be a healthy kind of conscience, not an unhealthy sort. And this is uh, important to be able to distinguish between the healthy conscience and maybe the unhealthy shame that maybe comes from outside, or the unhealthy, obsessive kind of, uh, you know, worry about these things. So this is what binds the chariot together. This is what gives the chariot direction. Yeah? When you have the right kind of shame and fear of the consequences, the chariot follows after the animals. Yeah? It follows after wisdom, and it drives off in the right direction. 
that is the pole, the pole that holds the animals together with the chariot uh, and brings it all in the right, right way. Huh? And then it says that uh, the mind is the strap. The strap is what binds the pole to the animals. Yeah, so the mind is, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but maybe it just means that the mind is required to hold everything together. Uh, yeah, without the mind, uh, uh, the commentary says that this refers to vipassana, vipassana like clear seeing, yeah, clear seeing of things. And uh, it is not a bad idea, but usually mind does not mean vipassana. So it's a little bit strange, but uh, I don't think it's wrong. I think it is kind of roughly, roughly right. Uh, but uh, everything happens within mind. So you can maybe say that mind is kind of the overarching thing that binds everything together or something like that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Huh? And then it has mindfulness is the careful driver. Yeah, mindfulness is the one that is alert. Mindfulness is the one that is aware. Mindfulness sits there, guides the chariot, yeah, guides everything in the right way, holds the reins. Yeah, and if the chariot is veering too much in one way, you pull the reins. Yeah, you say to wisdom, okay, wisdom, use that wisdom. Yeah, now it's time to be wise. Use that faith, use that. Um, confidence that you have, uh, yeah, animals, and then pull the chariot in the right direction. Uh. So mindfulness is that sharp charioteer. Uh. So you should build up that charioteer inside of yourself, yeah, the charioteer that holds the kind of reins inside of us, uh, that holds the reins of our hands, yeah, so we can do the right thing with our hands, uh, something like this maybe, or something good with our hands. Uh. So we, we are in charge, we can rein in our hands, we can rein in our speech, we can rein in our eyes and hearing, to make it all kind of head in the right direction. We are the charioteers in our own life. Then we're practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, then we're making the chariot go in the right direction. One of the beautiful um, similes for the uh, sati, for the sati, which is mindfulness that you find in the suttas. Uh, uh, it is said that, uh, uh, it is said that the, the dhammas, sabbe dhamma sat adipateya, and sabbe dhamma means all qualities, yeah, in, in other words, all our experiences of the world, uh, and they are sati adipateya, it means that they are, uh, they are like um, uh, under the control of sati, yeah, Sati is like the Lord. Sati is the master, the supreme commander of the, these Dhammas. So what that means is that if you have very good Sati, if you have very good awareness, if you know what is going on in your life, yeah, the more you know what is going on in your life, the more you are in charge. You are the, your own. You are the Lord. Sorry? Okay, someone was coming in there. I think I don't think it was to me, so that's good. Okay. <laughs> so you are the Lord in your own life. Yeah, you are in charge of your own life. And this is the beautiful thing with sati. When sati becomes very strong, uh, then what happens is that uh, uh, you know what is going on at all times. Uh, and because you know the instructions of the teachings, uh, you know how to change direction before it is too late. Uh, you can see that you are in a situation where anger is about to arise. Okay, something is happening. And then you change your perception, you change the direction of what is going on before it is too late. And then you avoid that anger and ill will. This is one, maybe one of the most important ways of using that sati. So when sati has that kind of power, yeah, and I have to admit, it's very difficult to keep that up in ordinary life, especially it is easier as a monastic, probably because we live lives that are a bit more structured maybe yeah a bit less busy in the in the sense that many people live their life but some lay people are also really good they do have a natural kind of sati so it can be done at least to some extent and you feel in charge yeah isn't that a marvelous thing to feel in charge of your own life you don't feel that other things are kind of um uh, kind of coming in from the outside and disturbing you and taking control over you. And you feel that all this stuff is just taking control of your life and you don't really know what's happening. And you can't really direct yourself as you want to. And your mind gets really busy. And you, before you know it, you desire this, you desire that. This upsets you. And you are kind of at the mercy of all these external forces in the world. 
You know what I mean? But instead of being like that, you feel in charge. You feel that your mind goes exactly where you want your mind to go. And you have this evenness in your life, this sense of just being really at ease, yeah, of kind of going through life in an even way, rather than being buffeted around by all of these forces in the world. This is the power of mindfulness when it becomes really strong. This is what it does. You're able to be in charge of yourself. So this is the idea of the charioteer. Yeah, you are the charioteer. You know what you're doing. You control your life. You drive your chariot. You drive your life in the direction where it should be going, on the Noble Eightfold Path, towards more happiness, towards Nibbana, towards Samadhi, towards all of these beautiful things on the Buddhist path. So please be a good charioteer in your life. Yeah, it will bring many benefits. And then the Buddha goes on to say that the chariot is equipped with ethics, yeah, with morality. Sila is the Pali word here. This is the equipment of the chariot of the Noble Eightfold Path. It is the equipment because without Sila to uh, kind of to be the foundation of your practice, the practice is never going to work. Yeah, the idea of being able to meditate, the idea of being able to be really mindful. The idea to do any of these things without um, ethics, without morality, it's just not going to happen. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, you need these things as the foundation. This is the basic equipment without which the chariot doesn't really get started at all. So again, it shows you the importance of sila in Buddhism as the foundation for everything that we do. So that's the equipment of the chariot. Axel is absorption. The axle of the chariot is absorption. This is jhana, yeah? And energy, it's wheels. So the idea that jhana is the axle of the chariot. So how far can you travel in a chariot without an axle? Not very far, yeah? It's going to go very slow. Even if the animals are very strong, you're going to be scrubbing along the ground. No, if you don't have an axle, there's not going to be any wheels. You're just going to be you know, stirring up a lot of dust. It's going to be very, very unpleasant, very bumpy. It's going to go very slow and probably won't get anywhere at all, really, if you don't have wheels and an axle. It tells you how important the jhanas are on the path of meditation, right? So are you going to have wheels and axle, or are you going to go scrubbing along the ground with the bottom of the chariot, just stirring up the dust? That is really the alternative. So for the chariot to have momentum, for the chariot to really move, to have that power to make that breakthrough to the Dhamma, you need the axle. You know, the jhanas have to be present. Without that, it doesn't work. It shows you something about the significance of these things uh, that, uh, you know, sometimes we argue about how important they are and all of that. Well, this gives you a very good idea of how significant they are. Yeah. And then the energy is the wheels. Yeah. So uh, the energy, of course, because it, uh, the wheels, they are, you know, they, they can go at very high speeds. They kind of fits very well with the idea of energy, yeah? the energy on the path. Uh, but you will notice that without the axle, that energy doesn't really take off. Yeah, you can't get any energy of the wheels. In fact, the wheels they become uh, dysfunctional once there is no axle there. So the energy needs to be collected together. Yeah, by the axle. Yeah, brought together. And when that energy gets brought together in samadhi and the profound states of meditation, then that energy becomes useful. Huh? But the energy which is not of that sort, it is too scattered, it is too sporadic, it is not powerful enough to really drive uh, the chariot of the Noble Eightfold Path properly. Uh, so again, you can see the connection here between these little details. Uh, this is, by the way, I should say that this is my ideas of the simile. I'm just reading it out and I'm trying to see what is there in the Pali and of course bringing in the experience from other suttas, etc. But uh, you know, uh, these similes, uh, they can be read in different ways. There isn't any final or absolute way of reading these similes. Uh, so uh, everyone, of course, is allowed to read this slightly differently and, and see, try to see what is in there. But I think some of the conclusions are fairly obvious. You can't really avoid them when you see it here. Yeah. And then it says equanimity 
and immersion are the carriage shaft. Uh, this is a quite, uh, this is a slightly unusual expression. I'm not sure exactly what it means. Uh, the Pali is, uh, uh, can be understood in different ways, uh, but uh, it fits here with the idea of jhana and, uh, and the chakka that all comes together. Yeah, the equanimity immersion here is uh, uh, samadhi. Uh, so you know straight away this is uh, Ajahn Sujato's translation. Yeah, whenever you see the word immersion, you know straight away Ajahn Sujato, Ajahn Sujato, not Ajahn Brahm. That's absolutely sure. Yeah, he, he would never use the word immersion. If you see Ajahn Brahm, he would use the word. Do you know what word he, word he would use? Uh, I will see how good disciples you have been of Ajahn Brahm. I'm going to test you on this one. Actually, I'm not going to test you. I will tell you, you, you know, Ajahn Brahm uses stillness, right? Uh, stillness is his favorite word. Uh, and I think it is a really, personally, I like stillness myself because it's very evocative. We can all relate to the idea of stillness very easily. Uh, anyway, so these are also uh, very important parts and they kind of fit together with the idea of jhana just before him. Uh, and then it has this nice little phrase. It says that it is upholstered with desirelessness. Yeah, the chariot is upholstered with desirelessness. And, and um, uh, this is, uh, again, very uh, a Buddhist idea of thinking about the world because uh, very often we think that upholstery, of course, in a chariot, upholstery is what makes the chariot comfortable, yeah? If there's no upholstery, if you're just sitting on a wooden bench, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be very, you know, like sitting on a wooden bench in meditation or sitting on a concrete floor. It's going to be very uncomfortable, especially if it's bumping around and jumping around because the road isn't very smooth. And uh, so upholstery, it what makes the ride nice and comfortable. Uh, so if you want to have a nice and comfortable ride on the Buddhist path, uh, you have to have desirelessness. That is what makes the ride comfortable. Huh? And again, it is very, the, almost the exact opposite uh, of how we normally think about life. Uh, we think about life as our desires being what kind of gives a comfortable life because we desire things and then we kind of acquire the things that we desire. And together it leads to a comfortable existence. So desire drives us towards comfort. Uh, but no, says the Buddha, this is not the way to find comfort uh, because the desire can never be uh, allayed, can never be assuaged uh, in this way by always running after it. Uh, the way to allay and, and to stop the desire is to go for desirelessness instead, to abandon those desires yeah, through this particular practice. Then you will have a comfortable ride. Uh, the ride which is always desiring things will be restless, will be agitated, and you won't really be comfortable on this particular path. So this is one of the factors of right intention at the very beginning there. So very, a very Buddhist idea again. And then it says that goodwill and harmlessness and seclusion are the weapons, yeah, the weapons of the chariot. And uh, so uh, goodwill here, of course, these words are the, uh, uh, this is like the avyapada in the Pali, basically means like uh, similar to metta and, uh, and uh, harmlessness is the avihingsa, the opposite of hingsa, which is like harming beings. Uh, and usually in this particular case, usually you would have nekama. Nekama is usually the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah, the uh, desirelessness or the uh, renunciation. But here it has viveka instead, uh, which is kind of interesting here. Uh, why does it have viveka rather than uh, nekama? And um, so, and the point of course is that uh, nekama, which means desirelessness or renunciation is very similar to the idea of viveka. Viveka means seclusion. Uh, uh, when you, uh, in the suttas, you always have two kinds of seclusion. You have the seclusion of the body, when you go on retreat somewhere, yeah, you come down to Jhana Grove or you become a monk and you go back to your kuti or whatever it is that you have uh, of seclusion. And once you are secluded from the world in that way, withdrawing from the world, then from that arises the seclusion of the mind, yeah? So seclusion of the mind is a seclusion from the five hindrances, uh, the giving up of the desire of the senses in the mind, yeah? This is what this is about. Uh, so the uh, uh, nekama and seclusion, uh, 
yeah, the desirelessness, uh, uh, the um, renunciation is very similar to the idea of seclusion. They come together in a very powerful way here. Yeah. So this is the armory yeah, of the chariot. These are the weapons that we use. And so whenever you have an aspect of ill will arising, or you have an aspect of maybe harming other beings arising, or you have too much desire, this is the weapons that they use to uh, stop those thoughts from arising here. Yeah. yeah, you take out, you have a, you can see that a little bit of ill will is about to arise, and you bring up the sense of a, a non ill will inside of you, the sense of metta, the sense of compassion. You look at that person in a different way. You think of the good qualities in that person. You think, wow, actually, they're really good people. Why am I getting upset with them? I'm just focusing too much on the small little things. Okay, I'm not going to be so silly again. And then you focus on the right thing and you use that meta, that ability to see the positive in other people to get rid of the anger. Yeah, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. This is very beautiful when you think about it. And the Buddha specifically, uh, there is a sutta where the Buddha specifically talks about this. Yeah, or well, actually it's Venerable Sariputta, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it comes from the same source. Uh, specifically talks about the Dhamma in this way, focusing on the good qualities of other people and thereby eliminating these kind of defilements. Uh, and then you have the abhingsa, you know, the sense of callousness, the hardness of the heart, uh, where we don't really care about our consequences of our actions on other people. Uh, and then we have the opposite of that is compassion. Uh, yeah, The opposite of being ruthless, uh, is having compassion for other people. Uh, and we use that compassion, uh, the understanding that everyone in the world is suffering, uh, the understanding that people in the world are blind, uh, they don't really know what they're doing. And we use that to overcome these problems. So, so this is our, these are our weapons, uh, yeah? And uh, so it's a beautiful kind of weapon, it's a Dhamma weapon rather than the weapons of the world. Uh, and then we have the shield and the armor, the shield and the armor that is patience, uh, so when we are patient in the world, another one of these very important spiritual qualities, uh, when we are patient in the world, we cannot really be uh, upset by others. Yeah? We have the time, we can wait, we are uh, willing to kind of allow things to settle, we can stand back from things. Uh, so patience is like the armory that uh, enables us to deal with difficult situations. Uh, yeah? Forbearance, patience. Uh, the ability just to allow things to be, to know that things are going to change. And all we have to do is wait, and then things will kind of come around and turn around later on. And uh, this is what you use as the chariot rolls on to sanctuary. Sanctuary is the yoga kema, the liberation from bondage is another translation of this word. And so you roll on towards the liberation from all things. Uh, yeah. And this is called the Supreme Brahma Vehicle. You can see why now, yeah, because it has all of these beautiful factors in it. Uh, and it arises inside of yourself. Uh, the path is part of who you are. The path is really your mind. Yeah, the path exists in your mind. Uh, it is part of your psychology. You look inside of yourself and you see if these qualities are there. Yeah, this is what the path is. Uh, I think sometimes we have the wrong idea that the path is some kind of a theoretical concept, maybe something outside of us. Uh, but no, the path is what is inside of us. Right now, the path is either in you or it is not in you. You're either thinking in the right way or you're not. Uh, yeah, And this is really what the path is about. Uh, it arises inside of you. Uh, and the wise leave the world through that path, uh, sure of winning the victory here. Uh. This is how you leave the world, yeah, the world which is, uh, remember, the world is kind of established on suffering. Uh, and as you, uh, as you practice this path, uh, then gradually you are uh, experiencing the uh, benefits of that path, uh, greater and greater happiness until eventually you discover the highest happiness of all, which is leaving the entire world behind. And yay, victory in battle. Uh, the chariot has done its purpose. Now you can dismount the chariot and you can sit under the palm tree and you can just enjoy yourself and you can just hang out. And then uh, that's what they do when you become an Arahant. Don't have to travel in that chariot anymore. So 
there you are. That is the Noble Eightfold Path, yeah? From a slightly different angle. So I hope that makes uh, sense to you. And if it doesn't make any sense, then uh, you can uh, complain to Ajahn Brahm this evening. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm will be really upset if you start complaining to him. So <laughs> no, he probably won't. But if you want to ask questions, you can always ask Ajahn Brahm. He will probably give you a, a slightly different view because that's how things are. Everyone gives a slightly different view and you can see what he has to say about some of these issues. So, so uh, let us move on to the next sutta. So if you'd like to bring up the sutta, you can. Now is the time. So uh, this sutta is actually called Crossing the Flood. That is what the sutta is called. And it's a very short one again. And it's one of these little things that is actually the very first sutta in the entire Sangyutta Nikaya, in all of the connected discourses, the very first sutta. And uh, it is always interesting because often the very first suttas, they are kind of chosen for a reason, yeah, because they uh, summarize the path in the way or because they, maybe they uh, give the foundation right view for the practice or something like that. Yeah, so they can be very useful in that way. Yeah. So this is a devata speaking to the Buddha. And this is what that devata says to the Buddha. Uh, how, dear sir, did you cross the flood? By not halting, friend, and by not straining, I crossed the flood. But how is it, dear sir, by not holding and by not straining, you crossed the flood? When I came to a standstill, friend, then I sank. But when I struggled, then I got swept, swept away. It is in this way, friend, that by not halting and by not straining, I crossed the flood. So, uh, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I find this really inspiring and nice. And it is uh, one of those little slightly cryptic suttas. Yeah, you don't really know exactly what is going on when you see it the first time. And it makes you think a little bit. Yeah, not halting and not straining. What do you mean? How can you not halt and not strain if you, if you are, uh, what, what else is there? Either you halt, yeah, either you kind of relax and you stop or you strain, right? What, what is there? Is there anything in between? And this is why this is interesting because it is like a, a little bit of a conundrum. And the first thing to understand about this is that when we talk about uh, crossing the flood, the flood, of course, is a, a sansaric existence, yeah, the kind of the flood of sansara, the traveling on in the round, moving here, moving there all the pleasures of the world, all the things that happen in this existence, uh, that is the flood of sansara, the flood driven on by craving, yeah? the flood of craving moving on and on and on, uh, moving from this life to another life. Uh. So we want to cross uh, sansara, and the way to cross sansara is, of course, through the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. So what we are seeing here, the idea of not halting uh, and not straining, is just another way of thinking about the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah not halting and not straining here. So what does it mean? And what it means is that you don't want to halt because halting means that you don't really practice anymore. Yeah, you stop in the middle of the flood, you're not going anywhere. And if you do that, then you sink. You sink in your own life. You sink because of all the powers outside of you that, that pull you back into the sangsara, pull you back into life, make you uh, attracted and attached to the world, yeah? If you stop practicing in the right way, the defilements tend to take over and you sink in the stream. You get immersed, enveloped by sangsara, enveloped by the water, yeah? and you cannot drown in the world of, uh, uh, of all the, what most people, how they live their lives. Yeah? So halting is no good. Yeah? You don't want to stop practicing. Yeah? So then maybe we should strain, maybe we should put forth effort, yeah? But the Buddha said, no, we should also not strain. Because the idea of straining here is using our willpower, yeah? Using this kind of force inside of us, which always drives you onward. 
And a lot of the straining in the world is based on craving. We don't really understand it, but it is based on craving. And even some of the straining or the effort that we use in the Dhamma can actually come from that craving. A wrong understanding, if you like, of how the Dhamma should, be, should work. So if we don't come from craving, if we don't, if we don't strain, if right effort is not about um, using willpower and using force, uh, then what exactly is it? Uh, and I think you will realize that what it is, yeah, it, it has to do with uh, the idea of right view again. The idea that right view is at the beginning of the path, uh, uh, the confidence at the beginning of the path, and that right view and confidence at the beginning of the path, uh, once they are established, uh, the path happens more or less automatically. Uh, once you hear the word of the Buddha, once you are su sufficiently brainwashed by the beautiful teachings of the Buddha, yeah, you get the good brainwashing of the Buddha, this marvelous Buddha, Buddha brand washing powder, yet you get yourself cleaned out a little bit and you get yourself kind of moving in the right direction, then it happens more or less automatically. You don't have to strain very much. You don't have to force yourself to do things. If you get it right, it will happen more or less automatically. This is the beauty of this, yeah? It doesn't mean that there is no straining, it doesn't mean that there is no effort, but it means that we try to make these things run on wisdom power, run on right view instead. And this is where this idea that I started off with a few days ago, I was talking about meditation practice and about you know how it is that someone like Ajahn Brahm, he tells you that the way to Practice meditation is just to sit back and to let go and allow everything to be and not to do anything at all. Yeah, this is how he often teaches meditation. And I know a lot of people, they say, but what, is it, what does he mean? When I do this, nothing happens. Yeah, it doesn't work for me. How come it doesn't work? When I do that, all I do is think thoughts all the time or I fall asleep or I fantasize about things or things don't, it doesn't work out. How can you do nothing? And this is the point, yeah? The point is, this is exactly where you see this particular teaching fitting in. And the point is that uh, uh, you don't halt. In other words, you don't fall asleep and you don't act, you're not restless with thinking mind. Instead, you have the view, the right way of thinking that leads the mind in the right direction. If you think about the world in the right way, if you have your priorities right, if you know where peace and happiness are to be found, yeah, in the stillness inside, not in the restless search for external happiness and these kind of things, then the mind will lean, it will incline in the right direction just by default because you have right view, because you have right confidence. You don't have to force the mind, this will happen all by itself. Yeah, isn't that a beautiful way of thinking about things? So instead of when you close your eyes, you may be tired for a while, yeah, a little bit in the beginning, but then when the superficial tiredness is gone from the mind, then there is this underlying wisdom which knows where you should go. And instead of then thinking about your, uh, you know, the, the worldly problems in your life, thinking about your family, your work, or whatever it is, the mind instead automatically moves towards peace. Why? Because it knows that is where it has to go. And this is the power of right view. This is the power of the right inclination of the mind. And this is the difference between someone like Ajahn Brahm when he meditates and a lot of people who have a problem in the meditation practice. Yeah, so this is how you, without straining and without halting, it has to do with wisdom, with the inclination of the mind, the mind automatically moving in the right way. So when you do your meditation, sometimes it can be useful just to remind yourself, yeah, a little bit about where happiness is to be found. Remember that the things of the world, your family, your work life or whatever it is, it is this endless merry-go-round. There's always new problems coming up. There's always new things to be sorted out. You may organize or sort out one problem, there's another one beyond the horizon. There's no end to this, yeah? It is pointless to always trying to solve these things because uh, you cannot make a stop of problems that way. Uh. So you instead come back, uh, you come back to 
uh, the understanding where the happiness is, you leave all of that alone, you let it be, you go to a place of stillness and peace inside instead. Your mind leans towards where you actually can find real rest, real peace. And then when you come out of that afterwards, uh, you will have far more ability to, uh, to um, uh, practice this path and do all the right things as a consequence. Uh, so that is the right way of dealing with these issues. Uh, so by not halting uh, and by not straining, yeah? instead uh, trying to use the wisdom of the Buddha, sometimes uh, a little bit of effort, a little bit of willpower is required, uh, but too much of the time, too, much, too many people use too much willpower in the meditation practice. Uh, when meditation happens purely through relaxing, through letting be, through chilling out, yeah, chilling out is a really nice word, just chilling, whoa, so chilled, yay. Then it becomes so beautiful, yeah, so marvelous, so exciting, so easy, and such a delightful practice when it happens in this way, instead of all those people who come to hate meditation practice, which is very common, yeah, oh, I hate the breath, the breath is so painful, oh, no, don't give me the breath, anything but the breath, yeah, please keep the breath out of here, don't want to have anything to do with the breath, which is terrible, because we have the breath with us all the time, if you're going to push the breath away, it's like push, pulling, pushing something of yourself out, out of the way, so leave the breath aside, don't even worry about the breath, instead enjoy what is happening, enjoy the peace, and then the breath gradually will come afterwards, don't make meditation into some kind of nightmare, yeah, it should be the opposite of a nightmare, what is the opposite of a nightmare? Uh, day, day mare? No, day mare? No, that doesn't work. Day, what is the opposite of mare? Mare is like a, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you make it into something delightful and beautiful. And that is kind of the idea here. So be careful with your meditation. Don't make it something which is negative and difficult. Anyway, so that is how you cross the flood, the flood of samsara. So uh, let us move on to the next sutta. So if we can have the next sutta, please. And uh, uh, next sutta is uh, from the uh, middle length sayings of the Buddha, uh, the Majjhima Nikaya, number 152. This is called the uh, Indriya Bhavana Sutta, the development of the faculties. Uh, and here the faculties refer to the senses, the six senses, uh, yeah? And so this is about how to deal with the faculties, basically, how we uh, deal with them in a good way. So this is very much to do with the right effort again, how to deal with the faculties in the right way. And this is a slightly different way of thinking about the faculties from how we sometimes think about them. Often we talk about sense restraint, and this is also a kind of sense restraint, but a little bit difficult, different from the ordinary way of thinking about it. So this is how it goes. Now at this time, uh, now, sorry, sorry, now is the time, blessed one. Now is the time, sublime one, for the blessed one to teach the supreme development of the faculties in the noble one's discipline. Having heard it from the Buddha, the blessed one, the bhikkhus will remember it. So that is Ananda speaking, asking the Buddha to give a teaching on the supreme development of the faculties. Then listen, Ananda, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, he replied, and the Blessed One said this. How, Ananda, now, Ananda, how is there the supreme development of the faculties in the Noble One's Discipline. The Noble One's Discipline is the teaching of the Buddha. Yeah, that's what it basically means. Uh, so, uh, or you can say in the training of the Noble One. I think the training of the Noble One sounds better than the discipline of the Noble One. Yeah. And the Buddha says here, Ananda, when a bhikkhu, a bhikkhuni, a Upasaka and an Upasika, yeah, the four assemblies, everyone is really included here, the four assemblies of Buddhism. When any one of these sees a form with the eye, there arises in them what is agreeable, 
there arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. Yeah, so this is what happens to us all the time. Yeah, when we, uh, in our ordinary life, we have sense impressions happening continuously all the time. There are sense impressions. Yeah, we see things with the eye. We see a beautiful person. We think, wow, what a marvelous, this person is just so nice. I love this person. Or we see someone we don't like and we get this negative feeling. Or we see some nice food and craving arises because we're hungry. We see some food we don't like and we think, yuck, that's yucky food. Or we hear some nice music or all the time, the sensory impingement yeah, gives rise to li likes and dislikes throughout the day, again and again and again. So here the Buddha is talking about how to deal with these things, yeah, this kind of broad picture. And a very important point here is also the attachments that we have to that sensory world. Yeah? When we're talking about what is agreeable and disagreeable, we're talking about all the things in our life, not just uh, you know, the food we eat and these kind of things, uh, but all the things that we own in our life, uh, yeah? all the uh, things that, all the material objects that are imp important to us in the world, uh, all of these things that we are attached to are actually a very important part of this as well. Uh, not just the kind of the superficial uh, likes and dislikes. Uh, and um, so there arises what is agreeable, disagreeable, and both. Uh, sometimes there are impressions we get, we both like them and dislike them. It's a bit complicated. Uh, and then uh, you understand this, yeah? There ha has arisen in me what is agreeable. Yeah, or at other times, there has arisen in me what is disagreeable, or there has arisen what is both agreeable and disagreeable. So this is the first thing, is our ability to understand these things. Yeah, and this is already quite difficult. You may think that this is obvious, that we should understand what is agreeable and disagreeable and what is both, but actually it is far from obvious at all, because often it happens very fast. Yeah, in our daily life, when we move around, these impressions come in, come in so quickly. Not only is it hard to be aware of all the impressions that come in, but when we talk about the disagreeable, as I just mentioned, we also talk about things we are attached to. Yeah, so when you come back to your apartment, yeah, you come back to your relationship, you come back to all of these things, that too is part of this idea of disagreeableness and agreeableness. It is a very broad spectrum of our attachments to people, to our house, our home, the things we own, even the status things in the world, all of that is part and parcel of this. Yeah, so there's a very, very broad field. And sometimes this broader field is more important than the daily kind of things. Okay, so you desire an ice cream. It's not such a big deal if you desire an ice cream. Yeah, it's kind of a small thing. But the big attachments in life, the big attachments to people, to the things that we own, our house or whatever, these are often far more problematic because they are big scale attachment and they are underlie the attachment to everything else. Craving and all of that is based on these uh, big scale attachments. So, so you understand this in a very deep way, yeah? That the agreeable, disagreeable, and both arise in you. And because you understand that, yeah? The next thing you understand is that this is conditioned. It is gross. It is dependently arisen. Yeah? So this is such an important understanding. Yeah? This is kind of the, the trick to move away from the attachment to that sensory world, yeah? To understand that all these things that we hold on to, all these attachments that we have, they are so unreliable. We never know how long they're gonna, gonna last. They are conditioned, they are sankata conditioned, and they are dependently arisen. What this means is that they, the, all the things in our life, they are upheld by other conditions. There are other things that support them, yeah? Like a relationship, for example, it lasts for a certain time, but then when the time has come for that relationship to break up, the relationship will break up. That is the nature of relationships. That is the way it has to be, yeah? We understand the conditioned nature of these things, of everything in our life. And it is, it is very obvious that it has to 
uh, be conditioned. Certainly when we die, we know straight away it is conditioned because it depends on our own life. That is one of the conditions, but there are many, many more conditions. And the deeper you see that, uh, the less interesting these attachments are, and the more worried you are about seeing these things as agreeable or disagreeable because you know down the track is going to lead to all kinds of problems for you. Huh? This is what it means, yeah? And I've talked about this already a lot, uh, understanding the nature of conditioned existence. So what happens to you? Think about your own life. What happens to you when uh, the world is doing funny things? Yeah, maybe you see that. What happens in the COVID situation? Do you find the COVID situation problematic? Or do you find it kind of, oh yeah, that's no problem at all. It's just par for the course, yeah? I kind of expected that is no big deal. Huh? What is your reaction? And if you didn't expect it, huh? If you feel that the COVID is some terrible imposition coming from the outside, it means you haven't really understood the conditioned nature of our existence. Yeah. If you expect stability in your society, and of course, in many ways, you know, places like uh, Singapore, especially, or uh, some other places in the world, they are very stable societies. And after a while, you think this is the way it's going to be. But actually, it is much more uncertain than we think. Yeah, it is actually quite unreliable. And we don't know how quickly these things can change. We got dulled into a sense of complacency when we think the way things are, it is the way it has to be in the future. But no, it is not going to. The one thing we can be absolutely certain about, it is not going to be like this in the future. Change will happen, and it will come from a place we least expected. This is the problem. So remember, when you are, if you are a bit concerned about COVID, if you are concerned about maybe climate change, if you are concerned about uh, you know, this uh, peace in the world or whatever it is, all of these things that seem to be so uncertain, well, uh, you know, don't be concerned, but at least be realistic about the possibility of these things. Uh, and when you do that, what happens? And this is the beautiful thing that happens. You start to turn in a different direction. You turn inwards instead. You turn to the spiritual path uh, because you know that your inner qualities uh, can never be taken from you. The external world, the inner qualities are safe from that external world. Uh, and you have something with you that is uh, valuable, that is worthy of uh, uh, practicing of developing because it can withstand all the external pressures, all of these problems in the world. Uh, so you turn away from the disagreeable. Instead, what you do, you turn to what it says here. You turn to this is peaceful. This is sublime. That is equanimity. Yeah, the peaceful and sublime is when you turn away from the ups and downs of the world, the desires and the, and the aversions. This is nice, this is not nice, this is agreeable, this is not agreeable. And you have this mind which is nice and stable in your ordinary existence. You go through life without the great attachments, without the great aversions. And you have a sense of balance in your life. Your mind is at ease. It is not being kind of buffeted around, rocked around by the uh, waves of samsara, the waves of existence. Instead, you have this evenness. Uh, you go through the world. You see how other people are always uh, um, uh, in the uh, grip of desire, yeah, and being led by the nose, like a bull with a ring through the nose, being led with a rope. In the same way, you are the slave to craving. But no, you're not that slave to craving. Uh, you look at the madness of the world, and you are at ease, uh, because in the middle of the whirlwind, uh, you stand still in the middle of the storm. You stand in the eye of the storm where everything is still and beautiful. This is the equanimity here, where you withdraw from that world which is so inherently unreliable. So this is the right way of thinking about this. You go to the sublime, you go to the peaceful, you go to that place inside of you of stillness, of peace, of equanimity that isn't driven, driven around by all of these winds of the world. So you understand how conditioned these things are. You understand how they are gross, it says here. Yeah, the gross, it means that they are uh, coarse. And the sensual pleasures, the disagreeable and agreeable in the world is coarse compared to the equanimity inside, which is far more attractive, especially when you then take that equanimity and you bring it towards mindfulness and samadhi. 
and all of these other qualities. Uh, and then the sutta goes on. It says the agreeable that arose or the disagreeable that arose or the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose, they cease, they come to an end and equanimity is established. Yeah, so you will notice here that this is basically sense restraint. Yeah, this is how we deal with the senses. This is how we deal with the defilements of the mind. And the way to deal with it, you will see here, is through wisdom. Yeah, it is the wisdom. You reflect about things in the right way. You understand that certain things are coarse. They are gross. You understand that they are conditioned, that they are unreliable, that they must change at a certain point. So it comes from wisdom. It comes from that right view about the world. And that right view is what enables you to let go of these things that are coarse. Again, it shows you the power of wisdom on the Buddhist path. I always like to point out that it is far preferable to deal with things through wisdom, to deal with things through understanding, through right view, than through using willpower, because it's so much easier. It's so much more smooth yeah this willpower is always you get tired and then you feel uh, you feel kind of really uh, uh, the energy is dissipated afterwards uh, but wisdom power actually leads to more energy uh, because you are letting go of things rather than pushing them away willpower is like pushing things away wisdom power is like letting go of things uh, abandoning them because you know they don't work uh, that is the difference uh, so here you can see the wisdom power being used. So these things cease because you have used wisdom power. And then you have a simile, just as a man with a good sight, having opened his eyes might shut them, or having shut his eyes might open them, so too concerning anything at all, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, or the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose, they end just as quickly, just as rapidly, just as easily, and equanimity is established. Yeah, just as easily as shutting your eyes yeah, or closing your eyes. Now, how much energy do you need to close your eyes? Do you need to put in a lot of effort to close your eyes? How much effort do you require to close your eyes? Not much, right? There's a feedback going. So only a tiny amount of effort to close your eyes, very small amount of effort. So I'm not sure there's a feedback happening on my speaker here for some reason. So I'm not sure what that is. Hmm. Okay, I'll just carry on and see what happens. And this is the point, yeah? the amount of effort that we need if we use wisdom is actually very tiny. It's a very small amount of effort, like closing your eyes or opening your eyes. Uh, and uh, that is uh, the problem. Um, so uh, I, did something happen there? Because there's a feedback on my speaker here. Something seems to have, did someone adjust something or something? Yeah. Yeah, they were tuning in. Is everything okay? Yes, we are fine here, Ajahn. Okay, I get, I'm getting a feedback on the speaker. I can hear my own voice here for some reason. I'm not sure why that is. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me, I'll just turn off the speaker on this side. Maybe some. Okay, so let's carry on like that. I'll turn the speaker back again later on, but uh, I was just getting some, it wasn't very good. So. Um, that is how you develop these faculties, yeah? and this is how you uh, deal with the faculties in the right way, and this kind of development of the faculties uh, means basically that we relate to our eyes, we relate to our ears in the right way. That is what is meant by development here. In other words, it's a mental thing. It's really a development of our wisdom. That is what it is about, uh, and that development of the wisdom is then what enables us to um, deal with the world in a skillful way. Huh? And then the Buddha says that, that is how yeah, then uh, there is the development of the faculties in the Noble One's discipline. Huh? I have just talked about the eye and the visible forms, uh, 
but the same thing is also true for the ear, yeah, for touch, for the tongue and uh, a taste, and also for a smell, of course, all the five senses uh, would deal with things in the same way. Yeah. And then I will just uh, finish off the sutta, the very last uh, paragraph here. So if you can please have the sutta up again. And uh, uh, now, so that is the development of the faculties for the ordinary person, yeah? But what if you are a person in the higher training? A person in the higher training is the stream enterer, the sotapanna, yeah? So uh, that person is uh, uh, then obviously has a different point of view. That is when your faculty of wisdom uh, has completely matured and your faculty of wisdom is absolutely stable. How is it? Uh, at the stream entry, the arahant or the noble ones deal with the faculties. Uh, this is quite interesting. This shows us where we are kind of heading, yeah, very, very slowly. And remember, these are the happiest people in the world, the noble ones. Uh, and this is how they deal with the faculties. Uh. So how, Ananda, is one a disciple in higher training, uh, one who has entered upon the way? Here, here Ananda, when the bhikkhu sees a form with the eye, there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises in him what is disagreeable, and there arises in them what is both agreeable and disagreeable. So, so far, we have exactly the same. Yeah, this is exactly the same as for the ordinary person. But then comes the reaction. This is how the disciple in higher training reacts. They are repelled. They are humiliated, they are disgusted by the agreeable that arose, by the disagreeable that arose, by the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose. So this is, this is very strong language, yeah, extraordinarily strong language. Uh, the, uh, Pali words here are, let's see the Pali words. Um, sorry. You don't have this on your screen because I, I, I have some, I have some more stuff on my screen. I always have more on my screen so that I can kind of uh, say things that you don't know about. Otherwise, you know, so I kind of come out as a, teacher who knows more, otherwise I'm in trouble. And so I, that's why I like to have little things kind of hidden behind the hair. This is the evil, the evil acts of a teacher. So, uh, yeah, so uh, the Pali words are actually very strong. They were words like uh, jiguchati and harayati, which means, literally mean that you are disgusted. And the reason is, the reason of course, why the noble person acts in this way is that the noble person knows that these things lead to, uh, lead away from mindfulness, lead away from samadhi, lead away from happiness. When the noble person sees potential attachment, they are repelled by that attachment. Yeah, they are re really don't want to even look in that direction. If they see excessive desire in the mind, yeah, and this especially refers to things like maybe sexual desire, which is very, can be very disturbing. Straight away, they feel humiliated and repelled by that because the power of that agitation, and they know that it leads away from the peace and the stillness of, of uh, uh, moving away from sangsara. So this is the power of the mind of the noble person. Yeah, It goes so far as to being humiliated by things. And this is where the idea of right view eventually lead you because you fully understand where happiness is to be found, uh, where real refuge from all of these things are to be found. Uh, so the Buddha says, this is how one is a disciple in higher training, one who has entered upon the way. What should be done for a disciple out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and out of compassion for them? That I have done for you, Ananda. There are these roots of the trees, uh, these empty huts, meditate, Ananda, do not delay, or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. So that is the Buddha's instruction to us. So what should we do next? We should meditate. Yeah, the Buddha has just told us we should meditate, so let's do it. But before we do that, 
let's have a short break, uh, maybe five minutes. Uh, we'll see you back again in five minutes' time. Uh,